The Confederates of the Army of Northern Virginia awaken on the morning of Tuesday, July 1, 1862, to find that the Federals have abandoned Glendale and its crossroads. During the past five days, the Confederates had forced McClellan to retreat as much as 20 miles. It is a significant achievement, but General Lee won't be satisfied until he has delivered a fatal blow to Major General McClellan's Army of the Potomac. The morning after the Battle of Glendale or Fraser's Farm, Lee huddles with his lieutenants over a crude map showing the primary roads on the Virginia Peninsula. It is a shortcoming of the Confederate High Command that Lee doesn't have a more precise map showing more of the secondary roads on the peninsula. General Lee traces his finger along the Quaker Road, also known as Will's Church Road, and tells those present, Major Generals A.P. Hill, John Magruder, D.H. Hill, Stonewall Jackson, and James Longstreet, that they are to march down the Quaker Road and get into position to attack the Yankees one more time. Lee's map does not show Carter's Mill Road, which parallels Quaker Road to the west. His staff officers discover the road later in the morning and use it to speed the arrival of part of the army to its proper positions. After the meeting, Lee sends members of his staff to convey his orders to those not present, including Major General Theophilus Holmes, who is on the River Road to the southwest, and Major General Benjamin Uji, who is on the Charles City Road to the west and, as it turns out, unaware that morning that the Federals had abandoned Glendale. Lee believes that the Federals are wary from marching long distances and fighting regard actions over the past five days. He hopes that the fight that is brewing this day will be different from the others, and that this time he would win a decisive battle that would result in the destruction of McClellan's entire army. Because Longstreet and A.P. Hill's soldiers are exhausted from the previous day's battle, in which they bore the brunt of the fighting, Lee directs that they are to serve as a reserve. The main attack is to be made by Jackson and Magruder, whose commands are to be reinforced with additional troops. Uji's division would join Magruder's command, while D.H. Hill would join Jackson's command. Further orders will be issued once Lee is able to make a personal reconnaissance of the field. McClellan had not been present on the field to direct his forces at the Battle of Glendale, nor would he be present when the fighting eventually gets underway at Malvern Hill. On June 30th, he had ridden to Hacksaw's Landing on the James River, which is closer to the fighting than Harrison's Landing. At Hacksaw's Landing, he boards the gunboat USS Galena and sails to observe a mission to bombard some of Holmes' rebels on the River Road. It is clear by this time to McClellan's staff that the general has completely lost his nerve during the past week and no longer has the stomach to command his army. Fortunately for McClellan, his corps commanders are well trained and experienced, and they cooperate with each other on the battlefield. Major General McClellan spends the night of June 30th aboard the Galena, but rides to Malvern Hill the following morning to inspect Major General Fitzjohn Porter's deployment of the army for the battle that is sure to occur this day. His greatest concern is that Lee will get behind his army and outflank him. The distance between his army and Hacksaw's Landing, because of the James River's course, is the greatest to the east. On that side, the Federals would have to cover a two-mile stretch of low-lying ground. McClellan advises Porter to place three corps facing east and use the other two corps to cover the north and west. The deployment makes sense considering that the forward slope of Malvern Hill is narrow and only so many troops can be packed in that space. After his inspection, McClellan rides back to the Galena. Porter has about 85,000 troops under his command. To secure Malvern Hill, he borrows Brigadier General Darius Couch's 1st Division of Brigadier General Erastus Key's 4th Corps. Brigadier General George Morrell's 1st Division of Porter's 5th Corps is positioned on the west side of Malvern Hill, while Couch's division is deployed on the east side of the hill. Facing west and covering the river road is Brigadier General George Sykes' 2nd Division of the 5th Corps which is supported by 37 guns packed tightly together to prevent a Confederate advance along the River Road. George A. McCall's Pennsylvania Reserve's division of the 5th Corps, which is now being led by Brigadier General Truman Seymour following McCall's capture the previous day at Glendale, is situated on the rear of the hill as a reserve. The reserve is further strengthened by four brigades detached from Edwin Sumner's 2nd Corps and Samuel Heinzelman's 3rd Corps, as well as a battery of heavy artillery that belongs to McClellan's siege train. Facing the east and deployed between Western Run and Turkey Island Creek, from north to south are the rest of the corps of Heinzelman and Sumner, and also William B. Franklin's 6th Corps. John Peck's 2nd Division of Key's 4th Corps is situated between Turkey Island Creek and the James River. Porter is assisted in his deployments by Brigadier General Andrew Humphreys, 
the chief topographical engineer of the Army and a member of McClellan's staff. The initial Confederate attack is expected from the north and perhaps also from the west. Facing north, the Federals are arrayed three brigades deep on each side of Malvern Hill. Together, Morrell and Couch have 17,800 men. The two Federal Infantry Divisions facing north on Malvern Hill are supported by six batteries totaling 36 guns, with an equal number of guns on each side of the Quaker Road as it bisects the hill between the Crew and West houses. It is a formidable position, as D.H. Hill tells General Lee when he says, If General McClellan is there in strength, we had better let him alone. To Hill's remarks, Longstreet dismissively replies, Don't get so scared, now that we got him whipped, referring to McClellan. Andrew Humphreys wrote of the position on Malvern Hill, There was a splendid field of battle on a high plateau where the greater part of our troops and artillery were placed. If confidence comes from numbers, the morale of those assembled must be high that morning. The ray of federal power is a magnificent sight, said Humphreys. Malvern Hill is not a rounded knoll, but an elevated plateau that rises about 150 feet above river level. The strength of the position for the Federals is that the cultivated fields of the two farms on its forward slope furnishes a splendid field of fire. The plateau is about three quarters of a mile wide and a mile and a half long. Flowing in the meandering fashion southeast past the north slope of Malvern Hill is Western Run, a tributary to Turkey Island Creek, which empties into the James River. The stream banks throughout the area are heavily wooded, and crossing the streams is difficult for large units except at bridges or fords. While the east slope of Malvern Hill gradually dips down to the creek, a portion of the west slope is a rock cliff that precludes any assault by infantry. Opposite Malvern Hill is an unnamed plateau about the same height as Malvern Hill. The Carter and Poindexter farms north of Malvern Hill would serve as staging areas for the Confederate attack. Behind Western Run on its east bank is the Poindexter farm where Jackson's command would deploy. Any Confederate troops marching along the Quaker Road and directed to deploy on the Carter farm situated on the Confederate right would have to cross Western Run. However, those that arrived on the Confederate right via Carter's Mill Road would avoid having to cross Western Run. On the Carter Farm, Magruder's command is to form up for an attack. Between the two plateaus is a dip in the landscape about 500 yards long that the Confederates would have to cross to reach the base of Malvern Hill. The Federal artillery atop Malvern Hill has sufficient range to not only target any infantry moving across the base of the hill but also reach the farms beyond, where the Confederates would deploy for battle. In his morning briefing, General Lee instructs Jackson to take the road first and Magruder and Uji to follow him. Longtree and A.P. Hill are to fall at the rear of the column. Any reconnaissance by the higher command would be handled as the troops are being deployed and not earlier. The reason for this is that we were on a hot trail, wrote Brigadier General Camus Wilcox. No sooner has the march begun than problems occurred. The inability of some of Lee's commanders, particularly Magruder and Uji, to promptly get their troops marching on the correct road would disrupt Lee's plans for a timely pursuit of the Federals that day. Magruder, who had not looked closely at Lee's map during the briefing, decides to depend on local guides to lead his division to his position. More than one road in the region is named Quaker Road, and the guides lead Magruder's column west on the Long Bridge Road toward a small side road that also bears that name. General Lee is feeling sick that morning and he has asked Longstreet to help him lead the army that day and substitute for him if necessary. Longstreet sees Magruder's division marching east rather than south and sends a member of his staff after Magruder to inform him of his mistake. When Magruder does not turn around, Longstreet rides after him. By the time Longstreet reaches Magruder's column, it has arrived at the intersection of the Longbridge Road and the wrong Quaker Road. Longstreet is unable to convince Magruder of his mistake. But when one of Lee's staff officers arrives with orders for Magruder to countermarch, Magruder obliges. Lee's staff officer informs Magruder that he does not need to march all the way back to Glendale but instead he can take Carter's Mill Road to his pre-attack position. The mix-up delays the arrival of Magruder's command at the battlefront by three hours. Uji also has trouble getting his men into position that morning. Because he is unaware on July 1st that the Battle of Glendale is over, he has ordered two of his brigades those of Brigadier Generals Lewis Armistead and Ambrose Wright to march south and attack the Federals at Glendale in the flank. 
When Armistead learns that there is no enemy to attack that morning at Glendale, he asks Lee for fresh orders. At the conclusion of Lee's conference with his lieutenants, a member of Lee's staff rides to Uji's headquarters on the Charles City Road to the north to inform him of the Army commander's plans for the day. Uji, a West Point graduate who is two years older than Lee, has extensive experience in ordnance matters, but his talent for leading infantry leaves much to be desired. His experience in the old army perhaps contributes to his reluctance to allow anyone other than himself to give orders to his troops. That arrogance would contribute to the problems Lee faces getting his troops into position for the attack on Malvern Hill. Since Magruder is not going to be able to deploy as quickly as Lee has hoped, Lee orders Armistead and Wright to move by the Quaker Road and deploy on the right of the Confederate line of battle where they would lead off the attack on the Confederate right. The two brigadiers lead the combined 2,500 men to the location specified and take up a position behind a ridge to await the arrival of artillery to contest the Federal guns. Meanwhile, Jackson's command, which comprises four divisions, begins arriving on the Poindexter farm about 11 a.m. For the coming battle, Jackson's command had been supplemented with two new divisions. One of the attached divisions is led by D.H. Hill, and the other is led by Brigadier General William H.C. Whiting. Whiting's men march at the head of Jackson's column and are the first to arrive at the Poindexter farm, where they take up a position on the extreme left of the army. Major General Richard S. Ewell's division takes up a position surrounding the Quaker Road behind Western Run. When D.H. Hill's division arrives in the early afternoon, it halts in the woods behind the Wills Church Parsonage behind Western Run. D.H. Hill's division is positioned in the center of the Confederate line, a place that Lee originally had hoped that Uji would deploy. Jackson's other division, led by Brigadier General Charles Winder, brings up the rear. Not including D.H. Hill's division in the center, Jackson has 20,000 troops and three divisions on the Confederate left flank to hurl at Porter. By 12.30 p.m., Armistead and Wright have their troops in position and are conducting their own reconnaissance of the Federal position on Malvern Hill. They see a white house with several barns around it at the top of the hill and some other buildings on the forward slope towards them, which are the slave cabins. This is a crew farm. As for the Federal artillery, the guns are nearly hub to hub. Behind them are several lines of infantry. The guns have a clean sweep of the open ground across which the rebels would have to charge to reach them. D.H. Hill, who's making the same observation farther east, sees the same menacing forces. If the first line was carried, wrote Harvey Hill, another and another still more difficult remained in the rear. The Federal line seemed almost impregnable, said Major Joseph Brent, one of Magruder's staff officers, who rides ahead of Magruder's column to observe the Federal position. At 1 p.m., the Federal guns facing north toward the Confederate main line begin a random but steady bombardment of Confederate forces opposite them. As shells crash around them, graybacks in the open hug the ground, while those in the woods seek protection behind trees. The fire was a terrible one, and the men withstood it well, wrote Armistead. Lee has chosen to make his headquarters at a blacksmith shop opposite the Willis Church Parsonage. That morning, Lee tells Longstreet to make a personal reconnaissance of the enemy position from the right side of the Confederate line of battle, while he undertakes a reconnaissance of the left side. They meet back at the blacksmith shop at noon to discuss final plans for the attack. Both have seen the need to establish strong artillery positions to counter the Federal artillery arrayed against them and knock out as many Federal guns as possible before the infantry assault can begin. Lee gives verbal orders to his chief of staff, Colonel Robert Chilton, which are to be crafted into a general order and distributed to the division commanders and also to Armistead. Lee's plan is to establish a grand battery on each flank that together would provide a converging fire on the Federal guns. If the bombardment is successful, then the infantry should advance. If not, an alternate plan of attack might be developed, Lee says. The order, as pinned by Chilton, reads as follows. Batteries have been established to act upon the enemy's line. If it is broken as is probable, Armistead, who can witness the effect of the fire, has been ordered to charge with a yell, do the same. The order as written leaves much to be desired. It not only makes a presumption that the Confederate counter-battery fire is likely to succeed, but also leaves the authority for deciding whether the attack should go forward in the hands of a Brigadier General. Moreover, the decision to make the signal for the attack a yell is absurd, 
as it would be nearly impossible for other commanders to know whether the yells they are hearing are from Armistead's brigade. To make matters worse, Chilton fails to put a time on the order to indicate when it had been issued. Jackson's command has 10 batteries, and some of those have lumbered along the Quaker Road with the divisions of Whiting and Yule, which have arrived at the front by early afternoon. Unfortunately for Jackson and the army as a whole, his chief of artillery, Colonel Stapleton Crutchfield, is ill that day and no replacement has been designated for him. Therefore, no officer is on duty to call up the batteries and show them where to deploy. D.H. Hill, whose troops are likely to go forward into battle as they are positioned on Armistead's left flank, have no artillery at all. Hill has sent his artillery many miles to the rear for an overhaul under an order previously given to him. It seems only logical that he should have been given replacement batteries from the Army's reserve, but no one can locate Brigadier General William Pendleton, who commands the artillery reserve. Without Pendleton's permission, it will be impossible to obtain any of the 14 batteries in the reserve. The responsibility for obtaining guns for service in the left grand battery eventually falls to Jackson. Stonewall rides from the Poindexter farm out to the Quaker Road in the search of his division's batteries. He's able to locate three batteries, the Staunton Artillery, Rockbridge Artillery, and the Rome Battery, and orders them to drive their guns onto the Poindexter farm. As for the right grand battery, it would have the advantage of more individual batteries, but that factor is negated by the matter of each going into action at different times. The batteries that unlimbered on the ridge in front of Armistead come from four different commands. Two batteries each from Magruder's and Uji's divisions, one from AP Hill's Light Division, and one from the Artillery Reserve. Seeing the need for as much artillery support as possible, AP Hill, who's on the north end of the Carter Farm near Longbridge Road, sends forward his best battery, Captain William Pegrin's Purcell Battery. On his own initiative, Captain Greenlee Davidson, commanding the Letcher Battery, which belongs to the Artillery Reserve, puts his battery into action in support of Magruder. The availability of batteries on the Confederate right is never in question. In addition to the six that either go into action or the attempt to go into action but are driven off by the Federal guns, there are another six batteries nearby that stay idle. Ultimately, the responsibility for the failure of these batteries would rest with Magruder, who has as many as 16 batteries under his direct control that day, and six more are attached to Uzi's division giving Magruder a total of 22 batteries, each with 4-6 to six guns. While it would be impossible to fit all those on the ridge opposite the crew house, it certainly could accommodate more than one battery at a time. As the day nears 2pm, the batteries of the Army in Northern Virginia prepare to exchange fire with the Union Grim batteries on Malvern Hill. The fate of McClellan's Army of the Potomac hangs in the balance in the coming battle. If the Confederates successfully seize the hill, it would spell disaster for McClellan's army. When the clock strikes two, the first Confederate shots of the battle on Malvern Hill are fired, and the final clash of the Peninsula Campaign begins in earnest. The Confederate batteries begin answering the Federal guns at about 2 p.m. on Tuesday, July 1, 1862, marking the start of the Battle of Malvern Hill, also called in some Southern accounts, the Battle of Poindexter's Farm. The Battle of Malvern Hill would be the final clash of the Seven Days Battles, and the climax of the entire Peninsula Campaign. The guns of the left grand battery opened up first. The leadership crisis in the Confederate right delays the deployment of the guns of the right grand battery. When the Federal artillery officers see the Confederate guns unlimber on the Poindexter farm, they immediately switch their harassing fire to the Rebel artillery crews. It is testimony to their skill and battlefield experience that the Southern artillery crews on the left flank can stand up under such fire. Their initial performance is impressive. They quickly find the range of the enemy targets and put out hot counter-battery fire. The shells from the Rebel guns produce considerable casualties among the Federal artillery crews and compel some Yankee officers to pull back their exposed infantry. The artillery duel between the left grand battery and the Federal guns atop Malvern Hill reaches its peak about 2.30 p.m. Since they lack any support from the right grand battery, the guns on the Confederate left initially take the full brunt of the Federal batteries atop Malvern Hill. Solid shot from Yankee smoothbore and rifled artillery sells over Western Run and lands directly on the three Rebel batteries that had moved into position. The Federal artillery fire smashes gun carriages, and it kills and wounds horses and men. 
The Confederate left grand battery, despite the valor of the gunners, is of the most farcical nature, wrote D.H. Hill. The Staunton, Virginia artillery is the last battery to retire on the Confederate left. Its commander, Captain William L. Baltus, who was struck by seven shell fragments during the artillery exchange, urges his men to stand up to the storm of Federal shells as long as possible. When his battery runs out of ammunition, he gives the order to withdraw. Beginning at about 2.30 p.m., the first batteries in the Confederate right flank attempt to go into action. The Federal artillery crews, particularly those in front of the crew house, turn their guns on the new threat. The Federal artillery fire against the right grand battery is so fierce that no battery can stay in action for long. Captain Greenlee Davidson, commanding the Ledger artillery, discovers that his Virginia battery can stay in action by having crews load the guns behind the crest of the hill. Once loaded, the men run the guns to the crest, fire them, and run them back down the hill to reload. Eventually, Captain Davidson also gives up the mismatched contest. After 3.30 p.m., other batteries in the Confederate right try periodically to go into action, but they are driven away almost immediately. The performance of the Federal artillery atop Malvern Hill is flawless and would be remembered by the Confederates long after the battle is over. Federal gunboats participate in the bombardment in the early afternoon, but their rounds fall indiscriminately on both blue and gray soldiers. Brigadier General Porter is furious over this and sends orders via the Signal Corps for the ships to seize their fire. The balance of Uji's division, which consists of Brigadier General William Mahone's Brigade of Virginians and Brigadier General Robert Ransom's Brigade of North Carolinians, arrive on the Carter Farm at about 3.30 p.m. Uzi chooses not to lead them to the front, but instead remains at the junction of the Long Bridge Road and the Carter's Mill Road, sulking about how Lee has circumvented him by issuing orders directly to his troops. When Brent finally locates him, Uji acts in a truculent manner. Brent tells the South Carolinian that Magruder wishes to align his units with Uji's division when it arrives and asks Uji where his men are deployed. Some of my troops have been moved without my knowledge by others independent of me, and I have no further information enabling me to answer your inquiries, says Uji. While Uji bickers with Brent, Armistead and Wright have watched Yankee skirmishers from Charles Griffin's 2nd Brigade of Morrell's 1st Division walk slowly down the slope of Malvern Hill towards their position. Their purpose is to try and shoot some of the artillerymen manning the Confederate guns. To counter the threat, Armistead decides to launch a limited attack to drive away the skirmishers. For the mission, Armistead calls up his three best regiments, the 14th, 38th, and 53rd Virginia. The soldiers in his brigade have been waiting in the woods behind the ridge where the rebel artillery has gone into action. When the three regiments are in position, Armistead puts his hat atop his sword and waves it in a circle as a signal for them to advance. At about 3.30 p.m., the Gray Infantry sweeps over the ridge with their weapons at the trail arms position. Once over the hill, they charge the Federal skirmishers, who, realizing they are heavily outnumbered, and quickly fall back towards their main line. During the charge, we encountered a red-hot storm of every missile, wrote Colonel Harrison Tomlin of the 53rd Virginia. Armistead's men advance about 500 yards, farther than Armistead had intended. Before halting to take cover in a shallow depression at the base of Malvern Hill, Armistead has only deployed them to drive the skirmishers off. But the colonels leading the three regiments think he means for them to charge the main federal position. Unfortunately for the Confederates, they quickly become the primary target of the federal artillery. Armistead, realizing that they would be chewed up badly if ordered to retreat, decides to lead them in position until the general assault begins, at which point they can join it. The three regiments would subsequently remain in position for nearly two hours under heavy fire. We held our position through all the storm of canister and shell, wrote Colonel Edward Claxton Edmonds of the 38th Virginia. While the Virginians are hunkered down at the base of Malvern Hill, General Lee is once again in the saddle. He rides with an escort beyond the Confederate left to reconnoiter the Federal position on the east side of Malvern Hill and determine whether it might be carried by a flank attack. If he feels it is feasible, he would order Longstreet and A.P. Hill to strike the Federals in the flank either that evening or perhaps the following day. What he finds is the bulk of the Federal Army in a strong position. The ground is also marshy where Western Run joins Turkey Island Creek. Lee's reconnaissance puts an end to any thought of turning the Union right flank. By 4 p.m., the general mood among the high-ranking officers of the Confederate left, including Jackson, D.H. Hill, and Whiting, is that there will be no major attack on the Federal position this day because it is too strong. All present have just borne witness to the skill of the Federal gunners, and it is probably clear to them that the Federals are eager for revenge following their series of humiliating retreats over the previous week.
Major General Magruder arrives at the front about 4 p.m. by the way of the Carter's Mill Road in advance of his troops and makes his own assessment of the situation. When Prince John Magruder sees how far Armistead's men have advanced, he mistakenly interprets it as a small success. When Lee returns from his reconnaissance of the Federal right flank, he receives a dispatch from Magruder informing him that Uji's troops have achieved a promising success that Magruder plans to exploit if possible. Lee also receives word from Whiting that some of the Federal troops on Malvern Hill are moving back, which Whiting misinterprets as the beginning of a general withdrawal. Whiting's erroneous observation is probably derived from his seeing some of the Federal infantry taking cover during the brief bombardment by the Confederate left Grand Battery. Although Lee may be contemplating calling off the attack due to the fact that the artillery has failed to achieve any noticeable success, he texts these reports as good omens, hoping that Magruder can expand on whatever success has been achieved by Armistead on the other end of the battlefield, Lee sends a dispatch to Magruder with the following order. Generally expects you to advance rapidly. He says it is reported that the enemy is getting off. Press forward your whole command. Magruder is prepared to hurl six infantry brigades at the Federal lines in his initial assault. His plan calls for using four brigades of Uji's division and two brigades from Brigadier General David R. Jones' division. But when Magruder sends orders to Uji's other two brigadiers, Mahone and Ransom, Ransom refuses to move unless Uji orders him to do so. Since Uji is nowhere near the front, this proves impossible. When Magruder rides back to the Carter farm to bring forward Jones' division, he comes upon his own division at the front of the column of troops. Magruder's division comprises the brigades of Brigadier Generals Hal Cobb and William Barksdale. Prince John orders them to prepare to assault the Federal position. He also gathers Mahone's brigade. Unlike Ransom, Mahone is more than willing to put his troops in the fight with or without Uji's permission. By 4.45 p.m., Magruder sends one of his aides to right with orders to charge the Federal guns by advancing to the right of Armistead's already committed troops. Shortly afterward, Magruder sends Mahone to follow right to add weight to his attack. Meanwhile, he sends Cobb forward on the same path as Armistead's three regiments have taken. Barksdale's Mississippians are farther back and go forward in a letter wave. Magruder's first wave is only half the number of men he had originally intended. Some of the brigades Magruder orders into battle that day become pinned down immediately by the Federal guns. Others push forward unsupported on either flank which is the case with Wright's brigade in the first wave. At every step my brave men fell around me, but the survivors press on until we had reached a hollow about 300 yards from the enemy's batteries on the right," wrote General Wright. Bluecoats from the 4th Michigan of Griffin's brigade try to get around Wright's left flank and cut him off, but Wright sees his threat and orders the 3rd Georgia on the brigade's left flank to change front and engage the Federals. For nearly an hour, Wright's brigade fights Federal infantry in the vicinity of the slave cabins on the crew farm. During this time, it suffers heavy casualties from canister fire by a battery of 12 pounder Napoleon smoothbore cannons led by 1st Lieutenant Adelbert Ames of Battery A, 5th U.S. Artillery. When Wright's brigade goes forward, the Confederates of Armistead's brigade, who had been pinned down by Federal artillery, rise up and with a cheer resume their advance on Malvern Hill. They make a valiant attempt to reach the Federal line to no avail. Six times was the attempt made to charge the Federal batteries by regiments of Armistead's brigade, and as many times did they fall for want of support on their left, Colonel Emmons of the 38th Virginia wrote in his reports. The carnage among the 38th Virginia exemplifies the severe casualties suffered by the men who charged into the teeth of the Federal guns. Before the day is over, eight color bearers of the 38th Virginia are either killed or wounded trying to carry the regiment's colors forward. The lack of support noted by Edmonds is soon to be corrected. By 2 p.m., DHL has received Lee's orders pinned by Chilton. When the Confederate artillery bombardment proves to be a resounding failure an hour later, Hill sends a note to Jackson, under whose command he has been placed, asking Stonewall whether his five brigades should participate in a subsequent charge against a daunting Federal position. Jackson's response is that Hill is obligated to follow Lee's orders since they have not been rescinded. Hill and his subordinates are thinking about where they will camp for the night when several brigades to the right emerge from the woods and with a rebel yell begin advancing rapidly up the long slope of Malvern Hill. Bring up your brigades as soon as possible and join it, Hill says to his brigade commanders. The first wave of Major General Hill's attack consists of two brigades, 
Sam Garland's Brigade of North Carolinians, and John B. Gordon's Brigade of Alabamians. The two brigades emerged from the woods at 5.30 p.m. in one long line with Gordon on the left and Garland on the right. Garland's Tar Heels have to cover about 900 yards of open ground over neatly mowed fields to reach the Federal guns. About halfway to their objective, the artillery musket fire from the Union lines is so severe that the rebels halt, drop to the ground, and begin firing from the prone position, which is contrary to Garland's orders. I sent my acting aide to camp to inform Major General Hill that unless I was reinforced quickly, I could effect nothing, and could not hold the position then occupied, wrote Garland. Couch's 1st Division is deployed facing northeast a few hundred yards in advance of the West House, and its soldiers are able to fire into Gordon's flank as he advances toward the crest of the hill. Couch has deployed two of his brigades in one line with another behind it in reserve. To engage the left front rank of Couch's division, which is held by Brigadier General Ennis Palmer's 3rd Brigade, Hill orders Colonel Charles C. Two to attack Palmer. Two has inherited command of George B. Anderson's brigade after Anderson was wounded in a skirmish leading his men across Western Run. Advancing on two's left is Brigadier General Roswell Ripley's brigade. General Hill orders his last brigade led by Colonel Alfred Colquitt to follow Gordon. The advance of the 8,200 Confederates in Hill's division worries General Couch. He asks Brigadier General Porter for assistance, and the 5th Corps commander sends word to Sumner that he needs two of Sumner's brigades immediately. Sumner sends Brigadier General John Caldwell's 1st Brigade of Israel B. Richardson's 1st Division at the double quick from the rear of Malvern Hill. Caldwell's Federals go into the fight on the far right of Couch's line. Sam Heinzelman, who's confirmed with Sumner when the request for support comes, volunteers to send Dan Sickles' Excelsior Brigade from his corps into the fight as well. Sickles' five New York regiments form up in a lane that runs behind the West House, where they can easily reinforce Couch's position. Some of Gordon's men come within 200 yards of the Federal guns, but Brigadier General John J. Abercrombie's 2nd Brigade of Couch's Division, which has been in reserve, shifts east to block Gordon's assault and support the artillery crews. On Hill's left flank, the Georgians and North Carolinians of Ripley's Brigade reaches the level ground at the crest of the hill, but they also receive double canister from level gun barrels that prevents them from advancing further. To Ripley's right, Two's brigade also receives heavy destructive fire from the menacing enemy cannon. Our men charge gallantly at them, wrote William Calder of the 2nd North Carolina of Two's brigade, noting the enemy mowed us down by the 50s. Time and time again, Hill's men rise up from the prone position and attempt another charge, but each time they are repulsed. We murdered them by the hundreds, but they again formed and came up to be slaughtered, wrote Lt. George Hager of the 10th Massachusetts of Palmer's brigade. Despite the approach of night, Magruder continues to gather troops to reinforce his attack. He rides back to the Carter Farm, where he finds Jones and McClaw's divisions approaching the front. Together they have four brigades, all which would go into the fight. Prince John isn't the only one looking for more troops to lead up the hill. D.H. Hill, who watches as wounded stream to the rear, also casts around for more troops to reinforce whatever success his division is having on the slopes of Malvern Hill. Finding the four Georgia regiments belonging to Brigadier General Robert Toombs' brigade, a Jones division without the commander, Hill leads them forward to support his division, even though they belong to Magruder's command. Meanwhile, Magruder puts Jones' other brigade, led by Colonel George T. Anderson, into action on the far right of the Confederate line in support of Mahone and Wright. The peaceful insertion of these Confederate brigades into the fight continues when McClaw's division arrives at the front. One of Magruder's aides breaks up McClaw's division, sending Joseph Kershaw's brigade of South Carolinians to support Hill and dispatching Brigadier General Paul Stone's brigade to support Magruder's command. As more Confederates join the assault on Malvern Hill, Federal Artillery Reserve Commander Colonel Henry J. Hunt orders the 1st Connecticut Heavy Artillery to fire its 32-pounder siege guns at the Sea of Grey Infantry trying to take Malvern Hill. The big guns cut 10-foot swaths through the charging ranks with a single shell. Hunt also sees to the steady replacement of field batteries on the front line as they run out of ammunition and are withdrawn. By 7.30 p.m., Major General D.H. Hill has broken off his attack against the Federal right atop Malvern Hill, leaving two brigades from Magruder's command, those of Kershaw and Toombs, to carry out a desultory exchange of fire with the Bluecoats of Couch's division. Jackson has been watching D.H. Hill's division as it is mauled by Federal artillery and infantry. Stonewall's troops have waited to be ordered forward, but Jackson has no intention of hurling them against Couch's reinforced division. When Jackson sees Trimble preparing to lead his brigade against the Federal right, he inquires as to Trimble's intent. 
What are you doing, General Trimble? asked Jackson. I am going to charge those batteries, sir, replies Trimble. I guess you had better not try it. General Hill has just tried it with his whole division and have been repulsed. I guess you had better not try it, sir, Jackson says. The Confederate units near the crest of the hill make one last attempt to capture the Federal guns in front of them before darkness prevents further fighting. Wright's brigade have clung precariously to its position near the slave cabins of the crew farm for nearly two hours when it rises up from the hollow where it has sought protection from the hellstorm of canister and goes over the crest of the rise toward the guns on Morrell's left flank. Screaming out the rebel yell, they run headlong into a line of Federal infantry that has been waiting below the guns for just such a charge. Upon them we rushed with such impetuosity that the enemy broke in great disorder and fled, wrote Wright. But the delay buys enough time for the Federal artillery to complete a withdrawal that is already underway to the crew house to prevent the guns from being outflanked by other Confederate regiments advancing obliquely on Morrell's left. Similarly, Kershaw's South Carolinians make a last assault astride the Quaker Road towards the Federal guns that are about 200 yards in front of the West House. They nearly overrun Captain John Edwards' Battery B, 3rd U.S. Artillery, but once again Yankee infantry holds them up long enough for the guns to be withdrawn. By 8.30 p.m., some of the Confederates moving up the hill have begun accidentally firing into the backs of fellow Southern soldiers in front of them. The Federal gun crews continue to load and fire into the gloaming until it is apparent that the Confederates have finally broken off their attack. When the guns fall silent, a steady chorus of cheers rise from the top of the hill as Federal troops celebrate their triumph that day. For the Confederates, it must have been a deeply disheartening moment as they reflect on the disaster that had befallen them and listen to the pitiful cries of their wounded comrades. The Battle of Malvern Hill ends with darkness shrouding over the battlefield, accompanied by the cries and moans of the wounded and dying sprawled across the field. Lee's army in Northern Virginia at Malvern Hill has suffered roughly 5,500 casualties, while McClellan's army of the Potomac have suffered about 3,200 casualties. Once the battle is over, Major General McClellan orders his army to retreat again under cover of darkness. It pulls back to Harrison's Landing, where it entrenches and is able to rely on the flotilla of gunboats for additional firepower. Lee instructs his army's cavalry commander, Brigadier General Jeb Stewart, to probe the Federal defenses at Harrison's Landing, and Stewart reports that he can find no weaknesses in McClellan's position. Fish John Porter has managed to preserve the Army of the Potomac's reputation at Malvern Hill. McClellan manages to keep his army at Harrison's Landing for six weeks while he pleads with Washington for more troops and mulls another advance on Richmond. However, it is not to be. A week after the battle, on July 8th, President Lincoln visits McClellan's headquarters at Harrison's Landing and, after inspecting the Army of the Potomac situation personally, tells McClellan he wants the army to begin withdrawing off the Virginia Peninsula back towards Washington as soon as possible. George B. McClellan's Peninsula Campaign, which began with such promise in the early weeks of March, is finally over. On August 3rd, McClellan receives direct orders from the War Department to return his entire army by ship to Alexandria, Virginia. Despite his protests, McClellan's army is to unite with Major General John Pope's newly constituted Army of Virginia for an overland offensive through Northern Virginia. With the conclusion of the Seven Days Battles, General Robert E. Lee is propelled to national stardom throughout the Confederacy. In just under a week, Lee has managed to successfully force back McClellan's massive Army of the Potomac from the very gates of Richmond, completely outgeneraling the young Napoleon. The Southern press, which had been so critical of Lee after he assumed command in early June, now praises the general as a great hero of the South for his role in saving Richmond from the grips of the Union Army. But Robert E. Lee's career as commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia has only just begun. As the weeks of July pass into early August, Lee will reorganize his army into two core sized formations called wings, with Stonewall Jackson commanding the left wing and James Longstreet leading the right wing. After realizing that McClellan's Army of the Potomac is withdrawn from the peninsula, Lee will begin shifting his forces north to contend with the looming threat of Major General John Pope's Federal Army of Virginia in the next major campaign of that summer, the Northern Virginia Campaign.